Tantor Audio, a division of Recorded Books, presents American Poetry, a very short introduction by David Kaplan, narrated by Amir Abdullah. Chapter 1. American Poetry's Two Characteristics Two characteristics mark American poetry. On one hand, Several of its major figures promoted American poetry as essentially different from any other nations. Although the reasons they offer vary, they typically claim that American experience demands a different kind of expression. Such poets advocate for novelty, for a break with what is perceived to be outmoded and foreign. As Walt Whitman wrote, Old forms, old poems, majestic and proper in their own lands, here in this land, are exiles. According to this view, America's newness requires a correspondingly new literature. What is majestic and proper elsewhere appears unimpressive and inappropriate here. As a consequence, American authors bear the responsibility of developing a literature suitable to their unique country by creating new forms and new kinds of poems. This emphasis on uniqueness even informs the work of American poets reluctant to commit to any national artistic endeavor. Inspired by it, they too feel the need to create new forms and new kinds of poems. On the other hand, American poetry hardly isolates itself from international developments. Instead, it might be more rightly called profoundly transnational. Its gaze extends beyond national borders, and its influences range widely. Just as individual authors move between different countries, American poetry often welcomes techniques, styles, and traditions originating from outside America. The American, observed T.S. Eliot, criticizing this characteristic, shows his too quick susceptibility to foreign influence. To understand American poetry, we must recognize both characteristics and their intimate, dynamic relationship. While to a certain extent all national literatures look both inward and outward, a particularly intense combination of the two characteristics inflects American poetry, influenced by its late historical emergence and rapid development. The two characteristics do not exist separately from each other. Rather, they work in a productive dialectic, inspiring both individual accomplishment and the broader field. Of the two, the first characteristic, American poetry's emphasis on its uniqueness, is often the easiest to overvalue, and the second, its transnationalism, is the easiest to neglect especially when American poetry turns boisterous and assertive. The temptation arises to isolate it from other countries and their literary traditions. According to this line of reasoning, the more American a poem is, the better it is. At its worst, this standard translates cultural jingoism into literary terms. It reduces American poetry by enforcing a crude standard on a complex body of literature overlooking the forces that energize it. Instead, the two characteristics stimulate American poetry with overlapping, competing, and sustaining interests. Both drive the poetry. They animate the poet's choice of forms, meters, and language, and the emphasis placed on originality, mastery of convention, or a combination of both. They add a certain intensity to the poetry and the debates it inspires. These characteristics predate the establishment of the United States of America. Consider Anne Bradstreet, the first poet living in America to publish an original collection of their own work. Though tellingly her collection, the tenth muse lately sprung up in America by a gentlewoman in those parts, was published in London Bradstreet was born Anne Dudley in Northampton, England, to a prominent Puritan family. Both her father and her husband served as governors of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Tutored at home, Bradstreet learned Greek, 
Latin, French, and Hebrew. She also read the work of many canonical Anglo-European authors. At 18, she sailed to America with her husband and father. In 1650, the Tenth Muse lately sprung up in America by a gentlewoman in those parts was published after her brother-in-law brought it to a publishing house without, Bradstreet claimed, her knowledge. True to its title, the book locates the Tenth Muse lately sprung up in New England, reporting back from those parts. The term Tenth Muse both connects Bradstreet to poets writing in England and distinguishes her from them. Like her English contemporaries, Bradstreet draws inspiration from ancient Greek and Latin sources, the muses of the Anglo-European literary tradition. She also represents a recent development, the Tenth Muse, added to the classical nine. The nine muses date back to antiquity. Arising in a foreign landscape, the Tenth is new. In a dialogue between Old England and New, Concerning their present troubles, Anno 1642, Bradstreet seeks to define the contribution that a voice from the periphery might contribute. In the poem, America addresses England as England faces the imminent threat of civil war. Noticing old England's downtrodden state, New England solicitously asks, What means this wailing tone, this mournful guise? Ah, Tell thy daughter, she may sympathize. During the exchanges that follow, Old England admits the guilt she feels over her debased religious state. My sins, the breach of sacred laws. However, she never sufficiently answers her daughter's question until New England presses her. Pray in plain terms, what is your present grief? The almost blunt inquiry jolts Old England, inspiring one of the poem's most conversational moments. Well, to the matter then. There's grown of late, twixt king and peers, a question of state. Which is the chief, the law, or else the king? One saith it's he, the other, no such thing. A dialogue between Old England and New employs many of the stylistic and rhetorical conventions of its day, placing the still novel perspective of New England within the English literary tradition. When she personifies England as the mother and America as the daughter, she returns her readers to a familiar poetic technique, personification and comparison. For instance, 12 years before, when sailing to America, seven Puritan leaders signed a document that faithfully called the Church of England our dear mother, from whom we have received salvation in her bosom and sucked it from her breasts. The signers included Bradstreet's father. Recasting the personification, Bradstreet also employs a well-established verse form. The poem is composed in heroic couplets, the era's dominant verse form. The poetic strategies Bradstreet employs cannot be separated from her theological and political concerns. They carry a particular charge. Most obviously, the poem exhibits the Puritan preference for a plain style, distinguished, as William Bradford advocated, with singular regard unto the simple truth in all things. When New England urges Old England to speak in plain terms, she admonishes Old England to follow her own example and act in true Christian fashion. This eloquence of this plain style should not be confused with an unlearned or artless expression. It need not lack passion, as also demonstrated by Bradstreet's most famous poem, to my dear and loving husband, a tender celebration of married love. In a dialogue between Old England and New, New Eng England zealously urges Old England to wage a vengeful holy war against those whom she denounces as the church's enemies, both home and abroad. 
The poem gleefully details the violence that old England should inflict on the church's foes. We hate Rome's whore with all her trumpery, she charges, urging, let jails be filled with the remnant of that pack and sturdy Tyburn loaded till it crack. After sacking Rome and all her vassals rout, England must not cease her bloody labors, but lay her turkey waste. And do to Gog as thou hast done to Rome. Like the poem's use of personification, its biblical and historical allusions employ a vocabulary familiar to Bradstreet's readers. They foreground the beliefs and, from a contemporary perspective, the hatreds that Old England and New share. While New England presents herself as a dutiful daughter, the confidence and sophistication with which she addresses Old England remains the poem's most striking feature. New England speaks the poem's first and last words, the opening and closing lines. She asks the poem's best questions and gives the soundest advice. By comparison, the poem presents Old England as self-involved and at times petulant. Consumed by her troubles, her fainting weakened body, and wasting state, for instance, she never inquires about her daughter's well-being. Instead, she seems far less worldly than her daughter. Scholars disagree about how to understand the relationship between Old England and New England that the poem depicts. One scholar reads the poem as a validation of the Puritan inhabitants of the New World's decision to remain in the New World. Another sees it as evidence that suggests she, Bradstreet, never really felt comfortable in America and that she often yearned for the land of her birth. The most rewarding way to understand the poem is to follow its invitation and to hear the dialogue it conducts between these attitudes, between self-validation and yearning. In the transatlantic dialogue, New England remains Old England's devoted daughter, but one who possesses her own perspective. New England deeply cares about Old England, closely following its political disputes and keeping many of its literary and religious traditions. However, New England also stands separate, not only geographically distanced, but also confident in her maturity, bolstered by the sense that her mother needs her wisdom. Nearly 300 years later, Wallace Stevens returned to the question of how to understand America's relation to England, focusing, though, on the connection between the two countries' poetic traditions, not their religions and politics. To explore this issue, Stevens' autumn refrain contrasts two birds. First, the speaker remembers hearing grackles, a kind of blackbird. The screek and scritter of evening gone and grackles gone and sorrows of the sun, the sorrows of the sun, too, gone. The inelegant grackle hardly resembles the nightingale, whose absence the poem laments. Not a bird for me, but the name of a bird and the name of a nameless air I have never, shall never hear. Two facts inform the contrast that the poem establishes between the grackle and nightingale. First, the birds sound dramatically different. Emphasizing this point, Stevens's harsh grating description of the grackles invokes the bird's harsh grating song. The squeak and scritter of evening gone call to mind the guttural squeaks, whistles, and croaks these birds make, which ornithologists describe as sounding like a rusty gate. In contrast, the famously mellifluous nightingale inspires much more pleasant associations. Messenger of spring, nightingale with enticing song, Sappho called it. Inspired by this enticing song, authors have long represented the nightingale as a figure for the poet. This history extends through canonical Anglo-European literature, starting with Greco-Roman authors such as Homer, Ovid, and Sappho, and continuing in the English Renaissance with John Milton and Edmund Spencer, among others. 
The association of the poet as a nightingale, however, achieved its greatest expression in English romantic poetry, most prominently with John Keats' Ode to a Nightingale and Percy Bysshe Shelley's A Defense of Poetry, where Shelley asserts, a poet is a nightingale who sits in darkness and sings to cheer its own solitude with sweet sounds. Second, Stevens's poem exploits a geographic fact about the birds. The nightingale is native to Western Europe and Northern Africa, while the grackles are found throughout North America. The birds' natural habitats do not overlap. When the speaker of Autumn Refrain acknowledges, I have never, shall never hear, the nightingale, he speaks like Stevens, as an American in America who has never traveled to Europe and never will. In Autumn Refrain, Stevens combines literary history and national geography. The nightingale represents the unlived life, the Anglo-European poetry the speaker experiences only secondhand. He laments that he will never directly encounter the nightingale's song or the literary history it represents. The grackle does not offer comparable pleasures or status. Even when not compared to the sweetly musical nightingale, the noisy guttural grackle hardly presents an attractive figure for the American poet. Nearly 300 years of cultural, religious, and literary history separate Bradstreet's and Stevens's poems. Stevens does not share Bradstreet's Puritan faith. A modernist, he self-consciously wrote during what he called the 20th century's age of disbelief. To see the gods dispelled in mid-air, he declared, and dissolve like clouds is one of the great human experiences. It is simply that they came to nothing. Instead of a plain style, Stevens celebrated what he called the essential gaudiness of poetry, a delight in language's flamboyant non-rational properties. Bradstreet would never write lines as fanciful as Stevens's command to a fellow poet seated at a piano. Play the present. It's who, who, who. It's shoo, shoo, shoo. It's Rick Nick. For Stevens, though, a poem sounds do not exist merely to reinforce the expressed meaning, to echo the sense. Instead, they perform what Stevens saw as poetry's noble function. It is a violence from within that protects us from a violence without. It is the imagination pressing back against the pressure of reality. It seems in the last analysis to have something to do with our self-preservation, and that, no doubt, is why the expression of it, the sound of its words, help us to live our lives. Poetry exerts a counterforce called imagination. It resists the violent impositions of reality upon it. Whether fanciful or somber, the sound helps us to live our lives. Lamenting his geographic and literary estrangement, Stevens employs a more restrained language in Autumn Refrain. The nightingale, not a bird for me, remains outside the American landscape, and by extension, American literature. Without the nightingale's inspiration, the American poet cannot follow Keats or Shelley. The riddling, desolate poem, though, also offers a faint hope. Something resides, some screeking and scrittering. Residuum. Autumn Refrain describes a moment of stillness that follows the grackle's noisy song. And the stillness is in the key. All of it is. The stillness is all in the key of that desolate sound. The silence bears a trace of the nightingale's unheard song. A residuum the speaker experiences only secondhand in the imagination as well as a trace of the grackle's guttural sound. Both the remembered and the imagined bird song intensify the absence the speaker encounters. By implication, Stevens suggests the dilemma he believes the modern American poet faces. Autumn Refrain presents English and American poetry as both separate and intimately connected. 
Distanced by time and geography, the American poet cannot directly experience the nightingale and the Anglo-European traditions it represents. In this sense, the poem distinguishes American and English poetry. Like the grackle and nightingale, they belong to different climates and sound quite different. Neither would be confused for the other. The speaker, though, experiences the residuum of both. The nightingale's absence haunts him. It contributes to the stillness that he experiences no less than the grackle's harsh song. Just as the speaker cannot hear the grackle, the Native American bird, without thinking of the foreign nightingale, the American poet remains consumed with the English literary tradition his work follows, but does not belong to. Its palpable absence deepens the desolate sound the speaker hears and the poem makes. Bradstreet and Stevens explore American poetry's connection with its earliest historical influence, England. American poetry's interest in other countries and their literature extends far beyond that one example. In most cases, personal and familial histories inspire American poets to write in an international context. Their American poetry hardly stands removed from other literatures and culture. Instead, their work migrates widely across national borders, feeding on new landscapes, inspirations, and questions. According to his account, Langston Hughes wrote his most famous poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, as the train he took from St. Louis to Mexico to visit his father passed over the Mississippi. At the time, Hughes was 17 years old. All day on the train I had been thinking about my father and his strange dislike of his own people, Hughes remembered. I didn't understand it, because I was a Negro, and I liked Negroes very much. In The Negro Speaks of River, Hughes replaces his father's racial self-hatred with his own racial self-identification, rooted in American geography and history, but also extending beyond them. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. The poem presents ancestral memory, not autobiographical disclosure. The experience it depicts exceeds that of any one life. Traveling across continents and historical eras, it describes three rivers rather succinctly, in 13 words or fewer, the Euphrates, Congo, and the Nile. The references to the Euphrates and the Nile evoke events that took place at different epochs in antiquity. They respectively mention when dawns were young and the building of the pyramids. The reference to the Congo more forthrightly straddles contemporary and earlier history. A scholar has called the Congo a pastoral, nourishing, maternal setting. For the poem, suggested by the speaker's memory, it lulled me to sleep. The Congo also carries a harsher association, King Leopold's violent exploitation of its population and resources. The following lines mention of the building of the pyramids reinforces the reference to slavery. When the Negro Speaks of Rivers appeared in Hughes's debut collection, The Weary Blues, a poem close to it, Proem, more directly mentioned this oppression, declaring, the Belgians cut off my hands in the Congo. Taken together, the three rivers suggest the grandeur and suffering of black history. They evoke the African roots of civilization and slavery's painful legacy into the 20th century. <laughs>
The fourth river, the Mississippi, differs from the first three. It serves as the great mythic river of American culture and literature. T.S. Eliot noted the river's stature in Twain's novels. The Mississippi of Mark Twain is not only the river known to those who voyage on it or live beside it, but the universal river of human life, more universal indeed than the Congo of Joseph Conrad. For Twain's readers anywhere, the Mississippi is the river. Hughes's description depicts a more specific event. Abraham Lincoln's journeys on the Mississippi in 1828 and 1831, which formed the future president's first real encounter with slavery. The impact of these visits on Lincoln's views of slavery, however, must remain a matter of speculation. The historian Eric Foner concludes, Hughes more confidently described these trips as a turning point in American history. I looked out the window of the Poland at the great muddy river flowing down toward the heart of the South, and I began to think what that river, the old Mississippi, had meant to Negroes in the past. How to be sold down the river was the worst fate that could overtake a slave in times of bondage. Then I remembered reading how Abraham Lincoln had made a trip down the Mississippi on a raft to New Orleans, and how he had seen slavery at its worst, and had decided within himself that it should be removed from American life. The Mississippi forms the poem's inspiration and primary scene. It also receives the most detailed description, including the poem's only name, Abe Lincoln, and the most developed image. I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. The Negro Speaks of Rivers returns to what Hughes calls a pivotal moment in American life. Like Hughes's train journey from America to Mexico, it crosses national borders yet remains distinctively American. Its cadences draw from Walt Whitman and Carl Sandburg, two of Hughes's early influences. The poem also presents a longer historical mystical knowledge. It offers a racial wisdom forged by ancestral memory. The repeated line, my soul has grown deep like the rivers, insists on this point that the poem draws from the soul's ancient knowledge accumulated over great expanses of time and distance, not limited by them. Hughes traveled widely, both within America and abroad. In 1932 and 1933, he visited the Soviet Union with 22 other African-American artists and intellectuals hired to make a film about African-American life in the South. The film was never made, but Hughes's time in the Soviet Union inspired him. He wrote a number of poems that expressed what one of his biographers called Hughes's steady move to the left. Good Morning Revolution, a parody of Sandberg's Good Morning America, greets the revolution, not Hughes's home country. You are the very best friend I ever had. Not surprisingly, the Saturday Evening Post rejected the poem after Hughes puzzlingly submitted it. Goodbye Christ is even more explosive. Make way for a new guy with no religion at all, it announces. A real guy named Marx, communist, Lenin, peasant, Stalin, worker, me. Written in the Soviet Union, the poem calls for an international workers' movement with distinctly American touches. Hughes bitingly decries the Rockefeller Church and St. Amy McPherson, a reference to Amy Semple McPherson, a prominent American evangelical embroiled in a number of sexual and financial scandals, including a kidnapping that many believed was faked. Hughes paid a price for his incendiary poem, McPherson's followers, accompanied by a sound truck blaring a recording of God Bless America, picketed a reading Hughes was scheduled to give 
leading him to withdraw from it. More damagingly, a number of anti-communists used the poem to attack Hughes. Hughes, you will recall, is the Negro communist poet famous for the communistic atheistic poem, Goodbye Christ. J. Edgar Hoover's aide advised him in a memo. Subpoenaed to appear before the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, Hughes faced a number of pointed questions about Goodbye Christ. Hughes defended himself in several different ways. He called Goodbye Christ an ironical and satirical poem. When pressed about particular passages, he demurred. That poetry may mean many things to many people. Switching tactics, he described Goodbye Christ as a dramatic monologue, a poem written in the voice of a speaker notably different than that of the author. I have explained the poem. For 22 years, I believe, or 20 years in my writings in the, in the press, and my talks as being a satirical poem, which I think a great pity that anyone should think of the Christian religion in those terms, and great pity that sometimes we have permitted the church to be disgraced by people who have used it as a racketeering force. That poem is merely the story of racketeering in religion, and misuse of religion as might have been seen through the eyes at that time of a young Soviet citizen who felt very cocky and said to the whole world, see what people do for religion, we don't do that. I write a character piece sometimes as in a play. I sometimes have in a play a villain. I do not believe in that villain myself. Hughes's cagey defense does not fully renounce the poem. Rather, it shifts responsibility for the ideas it expresses and limits its scope to an attack on religious hypocrisy, not a call for worldwide political revolution. The poem, though, bears no markers of a Soviet speaker, let alone a young Soviet speaker who felt very cocky. Instead, American slang and references abound. Grilled by the subcommittee's members and its chief counsel, Roy Cohen, Hughes needed to invent a villain, one who speaks without the author's endorsement. Hughes deflected blame for the radical socialist atheism by recasting it as a sign of Soviet arrogance. He did not deny that the poem criticizes racketeering in religion and misuse of religion. However, Hughes also added, I do not believe in that villain myself. The poem, though, does echo points that Soviet propaganda often raised. As a scholar notes, Goodbye Christ echoes Soviet anti-religious propaganda and campaigns for the new Soviet man, the calls for Marxism to replace Christianity and create a new revolutionary personality. Marx, communist, Lenin, peasant, Stalin, worker, me. Hughes's testimony strips the poem of its revolutionary charge. This strategy shows the complex relation of American poetry to nationhood. The American author defends his poem by claiming it voices an imaginary Soviet citizen's ideas, not his. As if only a foreigner were allowed to criticize America in such biting terms. Like Hughes, Elizabeth Bishop traveled widely, but haunting events early in her life did not allow her to develop a fixed sense of national identity. Bishop was born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1911. Because of tragic family circumstances, when she was young, her father died and her mother was committed to a series of psychiatric hospitals. She was raised by maternal and paternal grandparents in Nova Scotia and Massachusetts, respectively. These childhood losses haunt some of Bishop's most famous poems. Time to plant tears, says the almanac, Sistina notes. One art, a villanelle, catalogs a host of losses, great and small, that the speaker struggles to accept. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. Both Sistina and One Art employ complicated verse forms to explore heartbreak. 
A sestina repeats its six end words in each of its six stanzas according to a prescribed pattern. A villanelle repeats the first stanza's first and third lines as the last line of subsequent stanzas. Adding to the formal challenge, the first and third lines of each stanza rhyme, and the middle lines rhyme with each other. Bishop's skilled use of the forms achieves contradictory effects. It asserts a sense of formal control, a mastery beyond the depicted grief. At the same time, the repeated elements intensify the sadness the poem expresses. The villanelle's refrain insists, the art of losing isn't hard to master. And the Sistina's end words repeat their despondent vocabulary as if condemned to them. Almanac, child, grandmother, tears, house, and stove. In a particularly poignant acknowledgement, the speaker of One Arts admits, I lost my mother's watch. Read autobiographically, the watch recalls how little time Bishop shared with her mother. The keepsake's loss severs a connection between the mother and the child. It adds a loss to the loss. The villanelle's form works similarly, obsessively returning to and counting the sources of the speaker's grief. Bishop's youthful movements between families and countries left her with a sense of not fully belonging to either place. Years later, she remembered how she felt when she and the other American school children pledged allegiance to the flag and sang war songs. In my Canadian schooling the year before, we had started every day with God Save the Queen and the Maple Leaf Forever. Now I felt like a traitor. In 1951, when traveling in Brazil, Bishop suffered a violent allergic reaction to a Brazilian cashew tree's fruit. As she recovered, she stayed in Brazil for 18 years, supported by a modest trust fund, and published two poetry collections, including Questions of Travel, dedicated to Lota de Macedo Suarez, the friend who nursed her back to health and subsequently became her great love. Bishop also published translations of several major Brazilian poets. The title poem of Questions of Travel describes the overwhelmingly active, lush Brazilian landscape. There are too many waterfalls here. The crowded streams hurry too rapidly down to the sea. True to its title, Questions of Travel questions the traveler's restlessness that causes her to seek out new sights and sounds. The urge to see, for instance, the tiniest green hummingbird in the world. Wondering whether it would have been better to just stay at home, the poem adds a disorienting complication. Continent, city, country, society. The choice is never wide and never free. And here or there, no. Should we have stayed at home, wherever that may be? The poem's final line undermines what we think we know, what home means. After the previous line's almost commonplace question, should we have stayed at home, the terminal comma leads the reader to anticipate that the next line will introduce another idea, perhaps started with a new verb. Instead, the poem re-examines what it just said. It shows how hard it is to define the rather elusive place called home, wherever that may be. The collection Questions of Travel is divided into two sections, Brazil and elsewhere. As this arrangement reminds us, American poetry's home is not always in America. For Elizabeth Bishop, America is elsewhere, one of a number of places where her poems are set and where she derives inspiration. She writes American poetry, whatever that may be. <laughs>